All right, Deepwater Horizon, here we go. Or maybe I need to plug my... Counter redundant. Oh Lord, don't get started on the irregardless. <laughs> Is everybody here except Connor's not here? Well, that goes without saying. He probably will. Not here. Amanda's here. There he is. Speak of the devil. Carson's here. David, Cassidy, Gentry, Jay, Alex, Jordan. Connor's the only one not here, right? Casey's here. Dylan's here. Derek is not here. Mikhail, Jacob, Jake, Paul, Matt, Tyler, and Austin. So, 3.5 is limits at infinity. Now, this is not infinite limits. This is limits at infinity. So now we're talking about instead of the limit of something as x approaches 2 being infinity, now we're talking about the limit as x approaches infinity. So as x gets really big or x gets really small. So what we want to do is we want to determine the finite limits at infinity. Uh, we want to determine the horizontal asymptotes, if any, of a graph of a function and determine infinite limits at infinity we'll see that limits at infinity and horizontal asymptotes are pretty much inextricably tied together. Okay, So if something is approaching something as we go to infinity, it makes sense that that's going to have to be a horizontal asymptote. So we're going to see that those are actually the same thing. So we want to discuss the end behavior of a function, what it's doing on the far ends, either negative infinity or positive infinity. So if we look at the graph of 3x squared over x squared plus 1, we can see that as x gets bigger and bigger, what are we approaching? This line, y equals 3, right? Which, I don't know about y'all, it looks like a horizontal asymptote, right? As x approaches infinity, y approaches 3. As x approaches negative infinity, y approaches 3. Okay. Now, we're not talking about this yet. We'll talk about this in a little bit. But who in here remembers from 112 how to look at this and determine what the horizontal asymptote is? Does anybody remember? It's not so much formula as just a it's, it's just something. Is it no, oh, no, 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 no. Heron's formula is for area. No. If they have the same exponent, it's just the coefficients, 3 divided by 1. So that would be 3. There's go. If the top is higher than the bottom, there is no horizontal asymptote. And if the bottom is higher than the top, then y equals 0 is the horizontal asymptote. So we know that you're either going to have no horizontal asymptote, you're going to have zero, or you're going to have the ratio of the coefficients. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Now, if we take this and graph it, it's easy to see what the limit at infinity is, right? We can see what it's approaching. If we didn't have the graph, we could plug in values. If we plug in zero, zero over one is zero. We get zero. If we plug in negative one, three times one, it's 3, 1 plus 1 is 2, 3 over 2 is 1.5, right? 3 halves. If you plug in negative 10, you get 2.97. Negative 100, 2.99997. You get even bigger, you get closer and closer to 3 without ever actually hitting it. So you can plug values into your calculator and, and make a table and kind of see that this is going to happen. Right? That's one of the methods we have of finding a limit, right? We can always just plug values in and see what it does. We can do that with a table. 
So this table is suggesting that the limit at negative infinity is 3 and the limit at positive infinity is 3. So we would write it as the limit as x approaches negative infinity of the function equals 3, limit as x approaches infinity of f of x equals 3. Okay? So we've seen two different ways of doing it, graphically and tabular. Any problem with that, either one of those? No? Okay. So here is the math definition of the limits at infinity. So to say that a statement is true as x increases without bound means that for some really big number m, the statement is true for every x such that x is greater than m. Okay? So if it's true, if this limit exists for m, then it has to be true for every, m, every x bigger than m as well. So it has to keep going to infinity. So we'll say that the limit as x approaches infinity of the function equals L means that for every epsilon that exists, or for every epsilon greater than zero, and that's the, the range of the y values, there's a little pocket around the y value, there exists of m greater than zero, some x value, so that the absolute value of f of x minus L is less than epsilon whenever x is bigger than m. What does this mean? Let's look at a picture. There's some epsilon, which means I can have plus epsilon, minus epsilon. So I've got this range of values. That there's some m such that every x bigger than m stays inside this range. Okay? So if I make my epsilon this big, here's the m. Every value of x bigger than m stays within that range. Now, I should also be able to pick a different epsilon, a smaller epsilon, any epsilon greater than zero. So that means I can always make this a smaller and smaller window. So that means eventually my m will shift over. So it's m where that range Basically. It, I'm just saying that there is an m so that every x after it falls in this range. There exists some value m. If e gets smaller or epsilon gets smaller, that m is going to get bigger probably. But there will still be a largest number such that every value after that creates something in that pocket. Okay? This is all theoretical. This is all conceptual. It's not necessary for you to understand this theory to understand how to find the limit at infinity. I just want you to kind of understand some of the math speak. You know, I don't want you to parrot it back, but I do want you to kind of understand what I'm talking about. And that, to me, that's more important than being able to parrot back this formula. Okay? Now, Horizontal asymptotes. We just showed, and I just showed you when we did the graph, that the limit as x approaches infinity is going to create a horizontal asymptote. Right? If there is a horizontal asymptote, that's where it's going to approach. So the line y equals l, where l is the limit, is going to be the horizontal asymptote. So, yay. Well, totally not in this... Yeah, you're, that would be a, po a polynomial as opposed to a rational function, and any polynomial at infinity is going to go to infinity, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, too. Right now, we're just talking about rational functions, where we have something divided by something. Okay. Now, in figure 3.33, okay, remember this picture. The graph of x approaches the line y equals l as x increases without bound, right? So that's the horizontal asymptote. Remember. Horizontal asymptotes are not like vertical asymptotes. Uh, vertical asymptotes we can never cross, right? That's kind of one of the definitions of a vertical asymptote. It's here. We can approach it and get close to it, but we're never going to hit it. We can't cross it because it actually creates an undefined spot at that value. However, horizontal asymptotes are not like that. Horizontal asymptotes can be crossed. They can be crossed up and down. You know, you could have a sinusoid that is dampening all the way down into a horizontal asymptote. So it can go up, it can go down, it can go around it. It doesn't have to strictly approach it without crossing it. It just means that at infinity, it's going to get closer and closer to it. Sometime before infinity, it can cross it. Okay? It's one little distinction between horizontal and vertical asymptotes that I want to make sure that we're aware of. So it can have those values? It can. Yeah, there, there very well could be plenty of values where y equals 3. But at infinity, it's not going to hit 3. It's just going to get really, really close. Okay? So that line, y equals L, is the horizontal asymptote any time that the limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity is equal to L. 
So if I tell you the limit of this function as x approaches infinity is 7, what's the horizontal asymptote? Y equals 7, okay? That's all we're saying by this theorem or this definition. We're saying that if a limit at infinity exists, it is going to be a horizontal asymptote. Okay? Now, notice this at the bottom. Note that from this definition, it follows that the graph of a function of x can have at most two horizontal asymptotes. Right? I can't have more than two because I've got to have one at positive infinity and one at negative infinity. I can't have one in the middle because by definition, a horizontal asymptote is what's happening at infinities. Okay, so there's only at most two. Do they have to be the same value? For this class, yeah, they're probably going to be the same value because we're really only talking about rational functions that are that line up. There are some functions that could have different horizontal asymptotes depending on which uh, way you're going, but we probably won't deal with them. Possibly, but it. Once again, remember we're not we're not really caring about positive and negative so much as we're worrying about negative infinity and positive infinity. We're at, at the really far ends. But yeah, I mean you could. And if you've got piecewise functions, then everything gets thrown out the window. So now limits of infinity have the same properties as regular limits. So if we've got the limit as x approaches infinity of two functions being added together, then we can just do them separately. Okay, this is just like we do when we say something like, where's my pen? When you have the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus 3x. How do we do that? Well, we say the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared plus the limit as x approaches 2 of 3x, right? We just plug it in and do each one. We can do the same thing with infinity. Okay, we can take each one separately. And we'll look at one. Well, in just a second. Here is something that's kind of important. If you want to take the limit as x approaches infinity or negative infinity of a constant divided by a variable, if you've got a constant on top and a variable on the bottom to any power, the limit's always going to be zero. Okay? And this follows from our rule about horizontal asymptotes, where if the bottom is a higher power than the top, you're going to have zero. So not only is it a constant divided by a variable to any power, but it's any lower power divided by a higher power. So if you divide by God, that's funny. It just struck me with a higher power. Uh, but it doesn't really matter. We'll talk more about that, the horizontal asymptotes in just a minute. But this is a, a direct result of the same uh, horizontal asymptote rule. So if we want to find the limit as x approaches infinity of 5 minus 2 over x squared. Okay? Now, you have to be real careful. Because this is two separate things, right? So we have to do one first and do the second one. We can separate it into two limits. Yeah, it's going to be 5. Because you can take the limit of 5, which is, what's the limit as x approaches infinity of 5? It's just 5, right? It's a constant. What's the limit of 2 over x squared as x approaches infinity? That one's 0. So we get 5 minus 0. We get that the limit is 5. By infinity? It's approaching zero. Yes. Yes. You'll see that this is the case. We talked about what do we get if we divide by zero? What is the limit when we're dividing by zero? That goes to infinity, right? Because if you divide something by a really small number, it gets really big. Is infinity divided by infinity zero? Or is that the limit when we divide by zero gives us infinity. Because we're not really getting to zero we're getting really, really, really close to zero. So it's okay to divide by close to zero, right? Because so, we're talking about a limit, not, not an actual. Like infinity over infinity. That's an indeterminate form, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, okay? Now, 
Anytime we divide a big number by an even bigger number, you're going to get zero. Okay, because we're talking about limits. So anytime that the bottom approaches infinity faster than the top approaches infinity, you're going to get zero. Faster. It gets bigger faster than the top does. Then you're talking about dividing by a much bigger number, you're approaching zero. That's why x squared divided by x cubed would give you zero, because x squared is going to approach infinity, but x cubed is going to approach infinity faster. So you're going to have a bigger number on the bottom than you do on the top. Even though they're both super big, the bottom one is super bigger. Okay? And that's how I think about it anyway, super bigger. Here's the graph, 5 minus 2x squared. Notice I have a vertical asymptote, right? Where's my vertical asymptote? It's at zero, right? That x squared guarantees that I can't have zero in the denominator, therefore I have to have a vertical asymptote at zero. So basically this is like a gravity well with you know, a horizontal asymptote at three. Your event horizon is at five, not three. And then you know, it's like a, it's your black hole. Okay? What about this? 2x minus one over x plus one. Now, if we use the rule that I've already given you about horizontal asymptotes, they have the same power, right? x to the first, x to the first. So we're just going to take the coefficients and make a ratio. 2 divided by 1, 2. So there's your limit. It's 2. However, if we want to do this by hand, we can to divide or to, to get a limit like this, when we have a when we have a limit like this and we don't know what to do, the easiest thing to do is to divide everything by the highest powered variable. Okay? Because that's going to cancel those variables out and give you fractions that are constants over variables, which always go to zero. Do what? Highest power of this is x to the first power. So we're going to divide everything by x. Okay? Right, x to the first, x to the first. So those are the highest power, x to the first. So we're going to divide top and bottom by x. So what does this give us? Well, 2x divided by x is just 2. 1 divided by x is 1 over x. Here, x divided by x is 1, 1 over x. So what happens here if I put in infinity? What's 1 over infinity? Zero. Zero. What's 1 over infinity? Zero. What do I get? 2 over 1, I get 2. No, not at all. Remember, we can only cancel things out that are factors. We can't cancel things out that are being added and subtracted. Okay? And that's one of the, I still see, I see that all the way up through the highest maths I've ever taught, I've ever taken. People still want to cancel stuff out. Oh, it's the same, it's the same. I can cancel it out. But you've got to be careful that they're, they're factors. Okay? So here, we're doing the limit of each one, so we see that it's just 2 over 1. So we verified that that's a horizontal asymptote. So now, what we've really done is proven the rule that we used in 112 about horizontal asymptotes. That this horizontal asymptote happens this way because of limits. It's calculus that got us to that rule. We just kind of skipped the why and went straight to the, it just is. Now we know the why. Okay? Oh, no. <laughs> Not at all. Although, you know, you do, you know, they call it pre-calculus for a reason. You know, you learn things that you need for calculus, things like sketch graphing, you know, you need to know how to do all that stuff. Difference quotient, which leads us into taking the limit of a difference quotient, which gives us a derivative. You know, so all this stuff is, I mean, it's why we learn it, so. Their brain is not ready for it. They've done, you know, they've done all these studies about the, the normal brain and at what age you are equipped mentally to start processing higher order mathematics in 1188. For the, for the main brain. 
generally about 20 something. Yeah, I mean, generally a little older than college freshmen is when you're really prepared mentally to do math. Closer to 20 to 25. So, <laughs> no, I mean, you can still get it. It just takes a little more. Your brain is not like super ready to absorb. That's why I came back to my, I came back to school at 30 and I was just like, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me, give it to me. You know, I soaked it up, but I also had a math mind. They are, their brains are a little weird. <laughs> Did y'all see there's a uh, kid who just started Harvard or is it Stanford? One of the Ivy schools. He's like 12, 13. Yeah. Y'all, let me tell you something. This kid, I have nothing but prayers for him that he has a good life. Uh, he's going to be successful in whatever he does, but I don't know if he'll be happy. But... <laughs> Mensa? Yeah. She was 14 and she <laughs> has a higher IQ than. I'm going to. Well, I wouldn't give them that. I wouldn't tell them that. I would just be like, I was having a rough day. My stomach was a little tore up. You know, I had to leave and go to the bathroom. <laughs> so, yeah, so none of that was lies. I ain't going <laughs> I'm not lying to them. All right, so here we're going to find, these are the guidelines for finding the limits at infinity and negative infinity. One, if the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the numerator, or the denominator, then the limit is zero. Okay. That's the exact same thing as the horizontal asymptote. If the degree of the numerator is less than the degree of the denominator, you get a horizontal asymptote at y equals zero. If the degree of the numerator is equal to the degree of the denominator, then the limit of the rational function is the ratio of those leading coefficients. That's what we just did. And this is the same as with horizontal asymptotes. If the degree is equal, then you just take those ratios and y equals that number is your horizontal asymptote. If the degree of the numerator is greater than the degree of the denominator, so if the top is higher, you've got none. Okay? Limit of the rational function D and E. If they're the same, then all we're looking at is the coefficients in front of those values, in front of the, like if it's got x squared and x squared. Whatever's in front of the x squared, that ratio becomes what it is. Like when this one, you've got 2x over x, so 2 over 1. because it doesn't have a horizontal asymptote. Because what happens if the top is higher than the bottom? If I plug in infinity, the top goes to infinity faster than the bottom does. So, so you're hitting zero first. Well, zero. what happens if the top is bigger than the bottom? You get a whole number. You get a bigger number, right? And it, if, if I make the top bigger, I'm, it's just going to keep making the number bigger. So you just approach what? Zero. No. No. If the top is getting bigger, infinity. you approach infinity. Yeah. And we'll do that in just a minute. So, limit as x approaches infinity of 1 over x squared plus 1. Obviously is what? Zero because the bottom is higher than the top. Okay? <laughs> so there's really no math to be done in a lot of these problems. It's just look at it and give an answer. What is the answer to this one? No. Well, look at it. Here's the, the, bottom is, the bottom is higher, which means 1 over infinity, which is 
Zero. Yeah, if the bottom is higher powered than the top, it's always going to be zero. Here is a graph uh, that was made famous by an Italian mathematician, Maria Catana Agnesi. We call it the Witch of Agnesi. It's 8a cubed over x squared plus 4a squared. Why is that called the Witch of Agnesi? Because that's what they called her, and she was famous for discovering this <coughs> formula for, I, you know, I don't even know what we use it for. I just know. So you don't need that. Oh, no, no, no. I'm not, it's like, don't memorize the Witch of Agnesi. Nobody cares. I mean, it's a cool, it's a cool graph and all, uh, but looking at it, what would the uh, limit of this function be? Why? It is zero because the top doesn't have an x in it. Remember, we're only talking about x's here. A is a constant variable. So here, we've got nothing over x squared. That's going to give us 0. What if, it was, what if the bottom said a squared plus 4a squared? That would be 5a squared. But still, but was, that would be a constant. It would be, the limit of that would be whatever it is. It would be 8a five. squared over 5. No, not 8 over 5. It would be 8a cubed over 5a squared, you know. Because the A would be depending on that. See, this is what happens. We, what we do is we change and we let A be a value. If you let A be 1, then you've got 8 over x squared plus 4. And that's one particular graph. If you let A be 2, you get a different graph, but it's the same shape. It just changes the dimensions of it. What is the function of A? Yes. If we were taking the limit as A approaches infinity. Okay. It would be DNE if we were taking the limit as A approached infinity. Meh. Now notice right here. We approach the same horizontal to the right and to the left. This is always true of rational functions. But functions that are not rational may approach different horizontal asymptotes to the right and to the left. It's good to note that we probably won't see any. Polynomial divided by polynomial. What is a polynomial? No. It's a monomial with x to the zero power. Okay? Now, we're going to get a little wonky here. We want to find the limit of 3x minus 2 over the square root of 2x squared plus 1. Zero. I'll give you a hint. It's not zero. I want you to think of this. If you well, let's do it by hand and then we'll talk about it. Because it's really important to be able to do these by hand because of the signage. Because you've got x approaching infinity, you've got x approaching negative infinity. It's important to be able to determine what's going on here. So we're going to look at 3x minus 2 and the square root of 2x squared plus 1. What is the highest power variable here? Mm, be careful. Remember, it's the square root of x squared. So it's just going to be x, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to divide everything by x. Okay. However, we've got a radical. So instead of dividing the radical by x, we're going to divide the radical by the square root of x squared which is just x, okay? So we're going to divide by the square root of x squared. Because what is the square root of x squared? It's just x. But because I'm dividing into a radical, it's important for me to divide by a radical. I don't understand, because you said instead of dividing by x, we're going to divide by the square root of x squared. Right. It's the same thing. It's just he's keeping it like, just so it like light terms. Right. So it'll be let me, divide, let me show you what I'm talking about. You see what I'm saying here? It's the exact same thing. I'm dividing both of them by x. I'm just writing it in radical form so that I can do that division. Right. So if I do this, I get 3 minus 2 over x. Here, 
I can turn that into one big radical, right? Say 2x squared divided by x squared is 2 plus 1 over x squared. Now, if I plug in x as approaching infinity, what do I get? 3 minus 0 over the square root of 2 plus 0. Three over root two. If you've got two things being divided, you can just collapse it into one radical. Right? We know that square root of three fourths is the same as the square root of three over the square root of four, which is square root of three over two. So if I've got two radicals, I turn it into one big radical. x squared divided by x squared. Hmm. Yes. So that's going to be our limit. So as x approaches infinity, we get 3 over root 2. Now, what about as x approaches negative infinity? Okay. Now, this is where we have to do a little trick. Somebody say wait. What, the 1 over x squared? Anything over infinity is 0. We're taking the limit. 2 plus 0 is Right. And then the second half is the top. 3 minus 2 over infinity is? 3 minus 0. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right, so down here, we're still going to divide by x. But what happens if x is negative? which is what we're talking about here, right? X is approaching negative infinity. I can't just write square root of x squared. Why? Because the square root of x squared is always positive. So I'm going to have to put a minus sign out front of it. So when I divide this, I can divide the top just by x, but on the bottom, I'm going to have to divide by negative x squared or negative root x squared. Bless you. It's not, it's, x is negative x. It doesn't matter. The problem here comes from, if you just take the square root of x squared, if I plug in x is equal to negative 4, what's the square root of negative 4 squared? Positive 2, right? Well, positive 4. If I'm plugging in, yeah. right, if I'm plugging in 4, it's going to be positive 4. So, but if, what if I plug in ne uh, negative 4 to x, what do I get? Negative 4. So to make this be negative 4, I'm going to have to put a minus sign in front of it because otherwise that, that square is going to eat it. So this gives us 3 minus 2 over x, square root, that minus sign's on the outside. So negative 2 plus 1 over x squared equals 3 over negative root 2. But those are two different rates. Like that's not going to be like one side and the other side. It's not a rational function. Right? That's what we said. Only the rational functions are guaranteed to have the same asymptotes on both sides. A polynomial divided by a polynomial. Radicals are not polynomial. Well, no, they're just nothing. Remember, a polynomial has to have an exponent that is a positive integer. What is a radical? It's a fractional e exponent. So we can't, it's not a polynomial. So we get blah, blah, blah. We did this. We did this. We did this. 3 root 2. And then we plug in negative. And we get negative 3 root 2. And this is what it looks like. So notice, not a rational function approaching asymptotes, or approaching different values to the left and to the right.
that have different horizontal asymptotes. But that is the same thing. Hmm? But that was the same. It was part of the same thing. Yeah, oh, it's the same. Yeah, the function is continuous. It's just approaching different values on the left and the right. can't plug in a positive number. No, because we're approaching negative infinity. You're going to have to plug in a negative number. Hmm. You wouldn't do it. It's not that you can't do it. It's there's no reason to do it. If you're, plugging, if you're approaching negative infinity, why would you plug a positive number in? You're approaching negative infinity. You need to be plugging negative numbers in. Why would you, yeah, I mean, yeah, if you, pu if you plug in a positive number, you're going in the other direction, so you're not approaching negative infinity. Right? It's, I mean, it's not even should you or should you not do it. It's, it's, it doesn't make sense to do it. Because if we're approaching negative infinity, why are we even talking about positive values? Right? Now, when we're, t when we're approaching positive infinity, why would we talk about negative values? Right? I'm getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Why would I plug in negative 5? Okay. Does that make sense? You sure? Okay. All right. Infinite limits at infinity. So, most functions don't approach a finite limit as x increases. Okay. This is just the truth of polynomials for the most part. If you make x bigger, the function gets bigger. Okay? Most functions do not stabilize to one particular value. Most functions go to infinity. So the statement, the limit as x approaches infinity of the function equals infinity, means that for every positive number m, then there is a corresponding number n such that f of x is greater than m whenever x is greater than n. Okay. Uh, it's not even going to show me a picture of it. So what is this saying? If I pick a m, then there has to be a number n bigger than m such that when x is greater than n, the function is bigger than m. Don't worry about it. I know I'm confusing y'all. It would be helpful if I had a picture, but... And it is, a lot of it. Really, all it's saying is that as we get bigger, as x gets bigger, we're not stabilizing to a point. We're just keep on getting bigger. Okay? So if you've got the limit as x approaches infinity of x cubed, right? Because what happens if I plug infinity? What's infinity cubed? It's infinity. What about negative infinity? Negative infinity, because negative cubed is still negative. Okay? Positive infinity both ways. It's a parabola. Up, oh, up. Oh. Cube is up, oh, down, right? So, makes sense. So that's why that happens. Yet again, we have calculus showing why graphs look the way they do. Yeah. Why couldn't I got an email just then? And see what it says? These results agree with the leading coefficient test for polynomial functions. Yes? I don't remember what that was. So. That's what I just told you. X cubed looks like uh, this. <laughs> X squared looks like this. That was the leading coefficient test. All right. That's it. That is limits. Now. No, we got one more section. That's it for limits. Now, let's curve sketch. This is why we did this entire section, so that we would be able to graph functions.
Kind of. Yeah, because you're using, you're using derivatives, you're using limits, you're using all of it to, to sketch a curve. So this, yeah, your entire mathematical career has culminated in being able to draw a picture. <laughs> so we want to be able to analyze and sketch the graph of a function. So. Yeah, you're done. This is this is it for math. It's <laughs> a good question. I am better at math. That's. I feel like math's gonna fail. <laughs> Anybody, anybody that's had my class knows I can't draw, <laughs> so I, I, I got to own that one. I can't do anything about it. I do a lot, you know, it's amazing because I do a lot of drawing. I do a lot of sketching. I do a lot of this, and none of it has helped me get any better, so I don't know. It's a good question. Valid, but I can't draw on paper. Don't. It, I, I don't need it. It's just... <laughs> I can't draw. I have no artistic ability, so I, all my talents are in the math, you know, not or physics, which is just math. So, anyway, analyzing the graph. So when you're sketching a graph, either by hand or on a graphing utility, uh, remember that you normally can't show the entire graph, right? We can't draw from negative infinity to positive infinity, negative infinity to positive infinity, positive infinity to negative infinity. You just don't have that big a piece of paper, okay? So it's important to decide what piece of the graph you're going to show. If I look at these two different windows, notice it's two very different graphs, right? But they are both the graph of x cubed minus 25x squared plus 74x minus 20. This one is just kind of zoomed in on this range right here. So if you don't have a big enough window, you can't see what's really going on on the graph, okay? So if I were to graph this by hand, I'm going to have to do more than find these two x-intercepts and this relative maximum. You couldn't hear. This one goes to negative infinity, but this one doesn't. It turns around and comes back up. So because you don't have your window big enough, you don't really see what behavior is going on outside of this graph. Now, the goal is to make your graph wide enough so that you can draw an arrow on the ends and assume that we're going to infinity or that we're going to asymptotes. That's the goal, okay? So by seeing both these views, it's clear that the second one is a, a much better uh, representation of a graph. But by looking at this, can I say for sure that there's not a third view that's even better? Are you sure? I have a pretty good idea that that's about as good as you can get. There are no arrows, but what do we know about x cubed? Leading coefficient test tells us it has to go down this way, up this way, right? It can have at most two turns. One, two. So that's fairly true. So by just the pre-cal notion of, of math, we can assume that that's a pretty decent graph. It can't turn around again. But our question is, what about points of inflection? What about concavity? Is there some weirdness going on? So that's why we need calculus to verify that there are no other points that are you know, outside of our normal realm. Because it could change concavity somewhere you know, off of our graph. So here are our guidelines. First, determine the domain and range of the function. Did everybody do that? What? <laughs> so what is the domain of a function? Yes. <laughs> In Cal 1, that shouldn't be a, a uh, something you have to think about too hard. Domain represents which variable? X. X. Okay, it's all of the values for which X is applicable. So where is what values would be excluded from a domain? No, not y. Which values of x would be excluded from a domain? What 
gives me undefined values. Vertical asymptotes. Anywhere that the division by zero, right? There's one place. What about radicals? Can radicals be negative? No, I can't take the square root of a negative number. Therefore, any value that gives me a negative even radical is also going to be excluded from my domain. Okay? Uh, what about... Well, no, the intercepts will be okay. What about logs of negative numbers? Can't take the log of a negative number, right? So there's another restriction on our domain. You also can't take the log of zero. Where you can take the square root of zero, you can't take the log of zero. So there are these, these are the domain restrictions, okay? And those are your three main ones. Range is completely dictated by what? By whatever we plug X into, right? If we plug X in, we should get Y's out. Our range will be dictated by our function itself. Intercepts, asymptotes, and symmetry. Now how, do we, how do we find X intercepts? Set what equal to zero? Set Y equal to zero. The function itself. If the function is zero, that means it's on the x-axis, right? So how do we find y-intercepts? Set x equal to zero, okay? Uh, how do we find horizontal asymptotes? I know you didn't just, we just did it. <laughs> we talk about the limit, right? We're talking about if the top is higher than the bottom, then it's none. If the bottom is higher than the top, it's zero. If they're the same power, it's the ratio of the coefficients. Okay. What is the next topic? Logs? Logs? Next chapter. Uh, uh, I don't remember. I mean, all <laughs> like, I don't yeah. We got we to take the derivatives and all that of log and, yeah. We'll get that. Oh, no. We're going to throw you right in and say, sing or swim. <laughs> No, of course we're going to do a review of it. <laughs> You'll be all right. And most people don't. And that, one of the problems with logs is that you go too long without doing them. You know, you do logs in like 112, like this much, one section, and then you don't do them again until calculus. And it's like, okay. You, yeah, and most of the time you don't. I'm not going to lie to you. So we can't just skip it. As, as wonderful as that would be. Now, once we've got the asymptotes, we want to talk about the symmetry of the graph. How do we determine if a function has symmetry or not? We look and determine whether it's even or odd. How do we determine whether a function is even or not? Right. If it's, if it's a polynomial, if all of the exponents are even or you have a constant, then the function is even. And even functions have y-axis symmetry. So they flip over the y-axis. If every exponent is odd, no constant, just odd exponents, then the function is odd function, and it has origin symmetry. So everything that's in the first quadrant is also in the third quadrant. Is it if it has a odd? Or no, all odd. So for it to be even, it only has to have? All even. All, all even. No. no, if it has both, it's neither. It has no symmetry. Now, that's for just polynomials. For rational functions, if the top function is even and the bottom function is even, then the entire thing is even. If the top is odd and the bottom is odd, the whole thing is even. Then it's odd, right? If they're opposites, if they're opposites it's odd. If they're the same, it's even. Yeah, exactly. So then, we, after we've gotten all of that, we want to locate the x values for where we have the first derivative and second derivative being either zero or not existing because these are going to give us those critical values that are going to allow us to find relative extrema and points of inflection. All right, so we want to analyze and sketch the graph of f of x equals 2 times x squared minus 9 over x squared minus 4. Oh, we do. This is the, this is, this is the culmination of your mathematical career. So, we're going to start with pre-cal. I want to find, first off, the uh, x-intercepts. 
So how am I going to do that? Not the bottom. Just the top, really, because I'm just going to set the function equal to zero. And for the function to be zero, all I care about is that the numerator is zero. Doesn't matter what the denominator is. So really, all we're going to do is set the numerator equal to zero. Okay? So 2 times x squared minus 9 equals zero. We're going to factor that, right, as 2 times x plus 3, x minus 3, which gives us x equals negative 3 and x equals positive 3. Yeah, because it can't be 0. All right, so now we want to find the y-intercept. By setting x equal to 0. No, completely in the entire function. So you've got 2 times 0 minus 9 over 0 minus 4, negative 18 over negative 4, which is... 18 fourths, which is 9 halves. Or 4 and a half if you're graphing it. Okay. Now, vertical asymptotes. Here we don't have any radicals, which doesn't matter because that's the domain and range, but for vertical asymptotes, all we care about is places where the denominator goes to zero. So now is when we're going to set the denominator equal to zero. So we do x squared minus 4 equals zero, and that factors as what? Not squared. just so it gives us x equals negative 2 and x equals positive 2. This to do it. Because now, now that we've gotten this stuff, we're going to talk about the first and second derivatives. We're going to take the first derivative of this quotient rule, which is going to give you an ungodly, ugly quotient which you're also going to have to do the quotient rule on again to do the second derivative. So, yeah, it's going to take a lot of paper. Not, this is fantastic. This is, this, is why, this is what we've done. This is why we learned all this, is so we can do this. Really sucks. <laughs> Yes. All right. So we've got x intercepts at negative 3 and positive 3, y intercept at 4.5. We've got vertical asymptotes at negative 2 and 2. So if I graph just that, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Okay, so vertical asymptote, negative 2, positive 2. We've got negative 3, x-intercept, positive 3, x-intercept. We've got y-intercept at 4.5. Now, they're not going to get past the vertical asymptotes. Now, by our, by our pre-cal days, we know from here, am I going to have to go up or am I going to have to go down? If I go down, I'm going to cross the x-axis and I don't have x-intercepts to cross, right? So there's no way for me to be able to go down because I'd have to have x-intercepts. So this is going to have to go up. 
And since we're at vertical asymptotes, we're going to approach infinity both ways. Does everybody recognize why we have to go up? Right? We have no x-intercepts, so we have to go up. What both go down? Well, that's the question. Do they or do they not? What do they do? How would we determine that? We can't do a parabola because this one might could go down, but over here it couldn't go down because there's no vertical asymptote for it to approach. And it can't go up and come back down. You know, so the question is, is it going to go like this, or is it going to go like this? Okay. Now, how do I determine that? I did the vertical asymptote, so let's talk about the horizontal asymptotes. Looking at this graph, yeah, I'm just going to have horizontal asymptote where? Y equals 2. That means that in, in, at infinity, it's going to approach this way, which means this has to be going down. Same way with this one. This and this has to be going down. We would be done if this were precal, but it's calculus. So I've got to find, I've got to find the points of inflection. I've got to find, you know, all these first derivative, second derivative stuff. Yeah, we did this. All right, so that gives us that horizontal asymptote. So that would be a perfectly legitimate and acceptable graph for precal. Now, honestly, when you do it in here, most of the time they give you pictures and you're like, which one is, you know, they do multiple choice kind of questions. It's going to be easy to figure out which one it is by using just the precal. Okay, but we want to take it on the next step. So we want to find, we've got 2 times x squared minus 9 over x squared minus 4. So let's take the first derivative. So low d high is going to be 2 times 2x. minus high d low is just going to be 2x over low low. So if we multiply all this together, you get 2 times 2 is 4x times x squared is 4x cubed. 4 times uh, 4x is 16x minus 4x times x squared is 4x cubed. 4x, 9, uh, negative 36x over x squared minus 4 squared. So the 4x cubed minus 4x cubed minus 16x minus negative 36x is plus 36x. So those cancel out, and we get 20x over x squared minus 4 squared. So that's f prime. Now, before we do it, let's go ahead and apply the first derivative test. Where are my critical numbers here? What makes this go to 0? It makes the denominator go to zero. That's where it's undefined. But where does the function go to zero? Where what? At zero, right? Because 20x, we set the numerator equal to zero. We get x equals zero. So that means we're going to have 
a relative something at x equals zero, right? Did we have a relative there? We did. Now, remember, we have to talk about where a function is undefined, right? Where is it undefined at? Not four, two, two and negative two. But it's also undefined at two and negative two in the original function. Therefore, I don't have to worry about those as critical numbers. The only time we worry about undefined points as critical numbers are if they are also defined in the original function. So since they're not defined in the original function, we don't have to worry about them here. Okay? So we do x equals zero. So if I plug in negative one, what happens here? Is that positive or negative? Now, top will be negative, bottom will be positive because it's squared, right? So negative divided by positive is negative. So it's negative here, which means we're decreasing. If I plug in positive one, positive number divided by positive number is positive, which means we're increasing. So x equals zero represents what? A minimum, right? Because I decrease and then I increase. So that's the first derivative test to prove that we have a relative minimum. Correct. All right, so now we're going to take the derivative of this. Because we need the second derivative. So low d high minus high d low over low low. Something's up there. So here we're going to have x squared minus 4 squared. We can write that out as uh, x to the fourth minus 8x squared plus 16 times 20. Minus here we're going to have 20x times 2 is 40x times 2 is 80x squared times x squared is 80x to the fourth minus 320x squared right cuz i do 2x times 2 is 4x times 20x is 80x squared 80x squared times x squared is 80x to the fourth 80x squared times negative 4 is negative 320x squared All right, so let's multiply this out. We get 20x to the fourth minus 160x squared plus 320 minus 80x to the fourth plus 320x squared over x squared minus 4 to the fourth. No, we don't have to take the third derivative. <laughs> but now we do need to set that equal to zero. Did anybody see any mistakes in there? Before I start doing this, I want to make sure I didn't make any mistakes. Yeah, we're about to find out. Don't trust me. All right, so we're going to set 
negative 60x to the fourth plus 160x squared plus 320 equal to zero. So what's the common factor here? 60 won't go into 160. 20? 20 definitely will. So let's factor out negative 20. So that'll leave us with 3x to the fourth minus 8x squared minus 16. No, because now you've got 3, 8, and 16, so that's as far as you can go. 20 is going to be the biggest one. <laughs> All right, so 3 times negative 16 is 48. Negative 48 will factor as negative 12 and positive 4. So negative 12, 4, 3x, 3x. We've got negative 20 times x minus 4 times 3x plus 4 equals 0. All right, who is not up on factoring? Who's not good at factoring? So I use a process called the amazing method here. The amazing method. So let me show you how to do the amazing method. It is super amazing. So what we're going to do is, just like AC method, we're going to multiply the first and the last numbers together. Okay. <laughs> it's a method of multiplying A and C together to factor. How do you do factoring? I, I, trial and error? Trial and error. Yes, it's the poorest, it's the poorest method of doing it. Trial and error? I, yes. I have, a, I have a video on AC method that I will post into the, uh, the uh, playlist so that everybody sees it, so that if y'all want to go back. I got videos on factoring by grouping, fact, you know, all the basic ways of factoring. I'll post them in the playlist. But y'all pay attention to what we're doing because it's amazing. So 3 times negative 16 is negative 48. So I need to factor negative 48 into two numbers that add together to be the middle term. So I need two numbers that multiply to be negative 48 but add to be negative 8. 4 and negative 12. So here comes the amazing part. At this point, if I were doing AC method, I would rewrite this as 3x to the fourth minus 12x to the uh, squared plus 4x squared minus 16 and do factoring by grouping. I don't like to do that. I like the amazing method. It's quicker. So I'm going to take these two numbers and make fractions with them. They become the denominator of the fractions, basically. And I'm going to put this number and this half of that variable, so 3x squared, because I need them to both become x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. So you always take half of whatever the variable is. If it had been x squared, I would just use x. Okay. And then I'm going to simplify these fractions if they can be simplified. This can't be simplified, but this one can be, right? They're both divisible by 3. So that's actually going to be x squared over negative 4. So these are going to be your factors. 3x squared plus 4 and x squared minus 4. You wouldn't. Is that right all the time? Yes. But you, you couldn't do it with this execution? No. The amazing, the amazing method only works for the methods that we already know how to factor. I mean, you, we, don't, we don't have any rules for factoring cubes.
flip that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they did, but, like, yeah, they, they were like, the way you do but it is you just pick a number and you guess. It's wrong, too bad. Well, and, and trial and error, trial and error works, okay? No issue with trial and error. If you do this, you know the first one has to multiply to be 3. The only way to get that is 3 and 1. So you know that's going to be 3x squared and 1x squared. The next term, the last term has to multiply together to be negative 16. So you just have to start picking values that multiply to be negative 16. And then you have to start playing with the signs until you find the right things. If you multiply the outer and the inner, they should add up to be negative 8. 4 and 4. 3 times 4 is 12, and that's 4, so that has to be negative, that has to be positive. And there are. So now we've got to set these equal to 0. Can 3x squared plus 4 ever be 0? No, because x squared is always going to be a positive number. A positive plus a positive is always going to be positive. Can't be 0. Okay. However, can x squared minus 4 be 0? That happens at x equals 2, x equals negative 2. What do I know about 2 and negative 2 for this function? There's a vertical asymptote, right? Can't have points of inflection at vertical asymptote, right? So it has no points of inflection. All of that to determine that it has one <laughs> relative minimum that we already knew and no points of inflection. This is a really ugly problem. Most of the problems are not going to be this ugly. Like, let's be real here. We literally just spent like 30 minutes on one problem. And it's only like So, on all of these values, we, we have determined, this is, the, this is basically what we determined right here. From negative infinity to negative 2, it's concave down and decreasing. At x equals negative 2, it's all undefined because we've got a vertical asymptote. From negative 2 to 0, it's decreasing but concave up. At x equals 0, we have a relative minimum. From 0 to 2, it's increasing but still concave up. At x equals 2 is the vertical asymptote, and then from 2 to infinity, it's increasing but concave down. So we can draw that. Oh, it looks an awful lot like the graph we already drew. But what's important here is this statement. You can be certain that you have determined all the characteristics of this graph. That's what we did. We proved that there's nothing outside of this picture going wonky. Okay. You just make it, just adjust it. So you just draw the graph out a little bit longer. And right. Well, you know, or do like, like if it goes, like, you know, something happens at like x equals 40, just your hash marks are like 10, 20, 30, 40. You know, you just scale it. It's not hard. But that's all you got to do. Now, what we didn't talk about was when we did this, we got x equals 2 and negative 2. These are those critical numbers, right? The So we've got we've really got to do the test points to determine concavity, right? We didn't really we just assumed concavity, but we really need to talk about whether they're concave up or concave down. And we do that by plugging in those values and seeing whether they're positive or negative, right? So if we plug in negative three into our second derivative. What do we get? Think about this. A negative to the fourth power is still positive, right? But then this negative 60 makes it negative. But here, we've got a positive and a positive. The question is, is this still, does these positives overcome this negative? Think about 
think about if if negative three doesn't get it for you, think about uh, infinity, because that's where it's going, right? Negative infinity. Infinity to the fourth, much bigger than infinity squared. This 160 and this 320, irrelevant in terms of infinity, right? So I can say that negative x to the fourth is much bigger than x squared at infinity, right, at negative infinity. Therefore, the top is going to be negative. Here, it's to the fourth power, so it's going to be positive. So this is going to be negative. All right, what about at zero? Zero, zero, 320 over, well, no, negative 4 to the 4th, which is positive. So it's positive divided by positive, so it's positive. From 2 to infinity, we've got basically the same thing we had at negative 3, right? If we go to all the way to positive infinity, that first term is going to be negative. It's going to be much bigger, so we know that that's going to be negative. So the negative is being kind of heavy down, and the positive is Correct. So that tells us that we have to have concave down all the way to negative 2, then we're concave up in the middle there, and then concave down again on the end, which when we look at you know the graph, you can see this is concave down, right? These are concave up. This is concave down. And you notice that you do switch from concave down to concave up, but it's a, a vertical asymptote, not a point of inflection. All right. Sure. Because now we have to talk about something called the slant asymptote. Two slides. Come on. Uh, how, how is an asymptote slanted? Well, let's talk about it. Okay. Say we've got some rational function, but it has no common factors, okay? If the denominator is degree one less than the denominator or the than the numerator. Okay? I think in my class I skip slant asymptotes because we don't use them very often. But we're going to talk about them now just so we have them. Now, re be careful what it says. Having no common factors and whose denominator is of degree 1 or greater. Okay, so the denominator has to have a variable in it. Okay? If the degree of the numerator is exactly 1 greater than the degree of the uh, denominator, then it's going to have a slant asymptote. Okay? To find it, we're going to use long division to rewrite the rational function as the sum of some first degree polynomial and some other rational function. So we're just going to do long division on it. Do you all remember how to do long division? No. <laughs> so you've got x minus 2 into x squared minus 2x plus 4. So how many times will x go into x squared? No, it will go x times because x times x is x squared. So x times x is x squared. x times negative 2 is negative 2x. Then we subtract them, so we change the signs. Wait, hold on. Would you do 2x? x times x is x squared. Okay. x times negative 2 is negative 2x. Because we got to subtract, so we change the signs. So that gives you 0 plus 4. 4 is the remainder, so plus 4 over x minus 2. You always put the remainder over the divisor. If we're not up on polynomial division, we need to... I think I do, actually. Oh. So once we've done that, you'll see that... Uh, No, okay, so 
the slant asymptote will be this. X. X. In this case, it's x. Y equals x. So it's just the, the horizontal or the uh, diagonal line y equals x. If it, because that's what we got here. If it was 2x, it would be 2x. If it were 5x, it would be whatever. It's always going to be some. I don't care about it. When I'm doing slant asymptotes, all I care about is the part that's left. If you had x plus 2, it would be x plus 2. It would cross at 2 and have a slope of 1. Okay, so I mean, it'll be whatever is not part of the remainder. So it can't cross at 4 over x minus 2 and then have a slope of 1? No, because that's got a variable in it. It's not a constant. Do the long division and take the part that is not remainder. Okay? And that's going to give you a slant asymptote that it has to approach. I'm not sure whether there's any of these on the homework or not, but <laughs> good luck if they are. If you have any problems working on the homework, holler at me, let me know. Uh, I will post the test on Thursday. I may post it tomorrow. It just kind of depends on when I get it done. Uh, we do not have class on Thursday. Uh, I'm going to New York, so. No, it's take home test. I'm going to post it on Blackboard. It's going to be a hand test. Print out, do it, and bring it back to class on Tuesday. Yep. Homework, is, homework and quiz is now due Sunday.